Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Information Playground. My name is Ron Bush. I own Ron Bush Consulting, and we are a cybersecurity company. Uh, we consult with businesses and help them uh, avoid the, 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 well, I guess the pain of, uh, of data breaches and, and cybersecurity attacks. Um, the Information Playground is actually geared to, to an audience, though, that encompasses every lifestyle. Today, we're not going to be talking so much about cybersecurity. We're going to be talking about leadership. So if you're catching us on the radio, you're listening to WVLP. That's 103.1. And if you're local in Valparaiso, Indiana, you're able to listen to us on the radio. If you're not, I hope you're streaming us. And you can stream us from WVLP.org's website. I encourage you to go there. They're a great FM radio station. They do a lot in the community. And if you'd like to get involved, there's ways for you to do that. At the same time, if, uh, if you're not, you're probably catching us either on a podcast or you're catching us on YouTube. And all of those things are named The Information Playground. I hope that you'll subscribe to us in podcast or YouTube form. Uh, and I hope you'll also join us every Monday from 8 to 9 a.m. or Friday afternoon from 1 to 2 p.m. on WVLP. So with that, I've got a really nice man. His name is Sean Richards. He's going to be with us today. And he's got a, a company called Blue Sky Business Consulting. Uh, he's the CEO and founder of that company. And he, and he specializes in leadership. So I can't wait to, to hear all that you've got to say, Sean. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Ron. It's, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Well, my privilege and honor as well to have you on the program today. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. How'd you get started in leadership? You know, it's a, uh, it's, it's a fun story from my perspective. I hope other people find it interesting. It may be boring. I don't know. I, uh, I worked in small businesses for a lot of years, 25 years, uh -huh. and really enjoyed it. Had a great experience, worked with some fantastic people, worked with some great leaders, had the opportunity to serve in leadership positions myself and worked in the accounting and controller type positions as well as a COO of a smaller company and worked with some startups. But I found that all those years, as I was talking to people that I would ask them, you know, do you like your job? What do you do? Just kind of, it, it could be at a party, it could be in a work setting, it could be in all sorts of situations. And I was amazed at how many people said they didn't like their job. And so I would explore that a little bit more and well, why not? Or what's, what's the problem? And and it was, uh, it was revealing when people would say, you know, I, I like the job itself, but I hate my boss mm -hmm. or I hate the people I work with. Yeah. And as I said a second ago, I was blessed to, to work with people that I just absolutely loved working with. And I don't know of a single time when I didn't uh, have that experience. And so for me, that was a very foreign concept. And so that got me exploring a little bit, well, why is it that you would hate your boss? And why is it that you would not get along with your coworkers? And kind of what I call the human dynamic. What is it about the people that you're working with? Quite frankly, sometimes I'm looking at that individual and I'm saying, is it you? <laughs> Maybe it's you, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, two or three years ago, I had an opportunity to kind of explore and strike out on my own. And I decided that I wanted to get into to more of a, of a leadership development and especially in teams, really helping teams work better together for the very reasons I just talked about, because there were so many people that seemed to be struggling with that. Mm -hmm. And some of the things I think that we're going to talk about today, Ron, with regard to the current pandemic and whatnot, and how that's affected teams, there's been a, a really interesting uh, adjustment that a lot of people have had to make. And so for me, the, the, uh, the opportunity to be in leadership development and help other leaders learn how to communicate better with their teams and, and really turn those teams into high performing teams is just a thrill. I just absolutely love it. I love working with people that really want to be better and uh, want to become the best boss that they can be and be that boss that everybody wants to work for. So that was, that was kind of what uh, led me down that path into leadership. Gosh, that's great. Uh, you gave me a, a wonderful segue into, into a question that I've been wanting to ask you. So I'm going to take it. Please. How has leadership changed during this pandemic? Well, in, in some ways it hasn't, but of course, in many ways it has. Yeah. Um, I've always been a proponent that leaders need to really learn how to engage team members. 
but the problem is that with the pandemic, some things got kind of thrown out of whack. But really, if they're asking some, some really good questions, questions that quite bluntly they should have been asking before the pandemic hit, some ongoing questions just on a regular and consistent basis, then they really should be asking the same questions during the pandemic. And it could be everything from just how is your life? How is everything going? It could be, do you have the resources that you need? Do you have everything to get your job done? Is there something that maybe you're missing? That, of course, and I bring that particular question up for a reason, because as we entered the pandemic a number of months ago, and a lot of people were working from home, that was one of the first things that they discovered is, oh, wait a minute, my internet isn't as good as I thought it needed to be. Uh, I don't have a camera that I like. Um, the audio isn't as good. Now I've got family, and, and, and I think we're going to cover some of that as well a little bit later, but there, there are a lot of different ways that leaders need to work with their employees now as opposed to the, the before the pandemic. But really, the questions, those core questions, should be about the same. Maybe a few different answers that we're getting, but those core questions that really drive engagement and really staying connected with your employees, most of those will have stayed the same or should have stayed the same. Mm -hmm. And so leadership really is about connecting with people and with your employees and getting to know them one-on-one -on, -one on an individual basis. And that is probably the one area that has changed the most within leadership is the need to really understand each person's situation and to understand what are they dealing with at home? What resources do they need? Can they still be effective? Can they still be productive? And quite frankly, the whole productivity measurement has been modified a little bit. It used to be that if they showed up to work, you assumed they were being productive at work. And that may be true. You know, just the fact that they were in that, that environment and in a dedicated space and their coworkers were right there and they were having their meetings in the conference room, those kinds of things just naturally implied that they were fully engaged. But what happens when they step into their own environment and they don't have those positive influences, but nonetheless, they're not there. And now they have other distractions. Are they able to, to truly engage and be productive? And so the ways that we measure productivity may need to be adjusted as well. And so those are the key questions that leaders really should be asking themselves that, again, they, they probably should have been asking the whole time, but especially during the pandemic, there are some important questions they need to be asking. And those questions are going to be a little bit different depending on the industry and the situation, but there needs to be some consistent questions asked. And during the pandemic, you're going to get a little bit of a different answer. So... You know, I appreciate that. You remember the movie Nine to Five with Dolly yes. Parton and uh, Jane Fonda, and uh, I forget all the rest of them. Dadney Coleman was the the villain in it. Right. Now, I, I don't know that anyone's ever worked for someone as bad as him or things got as far out, <laughs> out of control. That's Hollywood. But, you know, I have worked with people. I have worked for people that the boss uh, kind of, he was kind of the epitome of them. I, I remember one guy... Uh, Man, he would get angry at, at uh, uh, board meetings. This is not on a board. I was a, uh, uh, one of the VPs at the company. And I can remember this guy would get mad. He would turn purple in his mm. face and he would just always oh, scream and holler. It was horrible. I, you know, today, I, I don't think you could get away with that kind of behavior. But he did back then. Uh, I've worked with people that, um, you know, they may not have been stealing money or material from the company but they stole time they just mm -hmm. goofed off they i mean they would they would take breaks uh, you know twice a day and, and lunch but they would go to the bathroom and they'd be gone forever you know they they hardly worked at all all day so i've seen both sides of that and i've been an employer i've had employees working for me and and uh, you know I, i'm i'm self-employed now and i work I struggle to work with sometimes with companies where I'm basically the team leader. I'm called in as a consultant and, and now I've got to bring everybody together, sometimes in very dysfunctional offices. Um, sometimes where, you know, I, sometimes I feel like I'm the only adult in the, in the room. Um, that's, a, that's just where things are. Not everybody's a nice person. Uh, and not everybody um, does things uh, that they, they know they should. And maybe sometimes they don't know they should. Maybe the values just aren't there. Maybe they've never learned them. So 
walking into this, what do leaders, what can they do better, especially with the pandemic in mind where, uh, you know, many are working from home. If they weren't good in the office, they're probably not going to be any better at home as far as employee performance goes. Well, what can leaders do to better lead their teams and their companies? Yeah, that's a great question. There are two things that come to mind, and we touched on one of them just a, a little bit, but I'll go a little bit more on that. And that is the importance of really checking in regularly with team members. Um, and each, each situation is a little bit different. You have team leaders that are, are leading a team of four or five people. And then you have the, the CEOs and the executives that are leading a company of 100. Mm -hmm. And so how you do this is going to be a little bit different from company and, and situation to situation. But the need to check in more regularly with employees is more critical now than it ever has been before. Mm -hmm. People need that constant connection. And when we're separated virtually, they're going to lose that. And so the importance of checking in, making sure they're doing okay. And again, we, we talked about this a minute ago, but it's not just about, are you getting your job done? Are you getting the work done? Are you hitting your, your, your requirements and your deadlines and everything else? But it's, it's that human side of it too. It's the, how is everything at home? Your kid's doing okay? Um, is the work schedule working for you? Because a lot of, of, of parents are having to both parents are at home and they're working from home and they've got kids. Some of them are in school and the kids need a little motivation and whatnot. And they some have younger children that are not in school and therefore they're, they have nothing else to do. And so there's some real challenges there. And having that regular communication just, first of all, shows that you care about the employee as a person, not just as a, uh, a member of the team getting work done. So the first thing I would say is just that ongoing discussion and regularly checking in. And that's going to be different from person to person. For some people, once a week is sufficient. Other people, that may be too much. They may feel like, you keep asking me, everything's fine, just let's move on. <laughs> and so you kind of need to ask each person, hey, how often can I check in with you? Is it is it okay to check in once a week or once a month? Or it, it just depends. And so again, that individual approach and trying to understand what works for each employee. Um, the second thing that I would mention about leading teams and how to do that a little bit better is the focus on the why. And Simon Sinek referenced that. He, he talked about always make sure you start with why. And, and I have found as I've worked with teams and leaders, that question gets overlooked a lot. We don't ask that question enough. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this particular task? Why are we in business? Why are we pursuing these particular customers? What Those questions can be asked over and over again. And even if you think you've got the answer to that question a year later, you may want to ask it again to make sure that you're, you're still aligned with that original vision of what you want to do. But that, uh, that connection that the employees need and want to have is so critical. That connection between what they're doing in their job every day, the tasks that they do, they want to feel like they are connected to the why of the company. Why does this company exist? And we could take a whole bunch of time to talk about hiring and some, some questions to ask about how to hire and, and whatnot. But really, it, it, whether it's a hiring process or whether it's existing employees, it is so important to make sure that they feel that connection with that vision or mission of the company. And, you know, you're in cybersecurity. And so I suspect, I, I'm not a, a, an expert in that field, but I suspect that there are some pretty routine and mundane tasks that need to be done on a regular and consistent basis. And I'm guessing that uh, those employees that are doing those tasks may get bored and they may start to kind of slack off a little bit and, oh, this is boring and whatnot. But helping them stay connected to that is so critical um, that, that really helps drive the engagement. And, and you can speak better to the cybersecurity industry there, Rod. So I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Does, that. does that seem to resonate with what happens there? Completely. I did a, uh, I did a, a presentation, I actually did two of them. Um, I've done uh, uh, several of them for this organization, but it's a, it's a CPA association. And so, um, oh, back in the spring, I'm going to say April or May, I did, uh, I did some presentations for them on, on working from home and all that, uh, that goes with that. And from a cybersecurity standpoint, it is, uh, it is far more challenging to, to have staff working from home 
because you don't know what they're in. The, the right way to do it is, is to buy the connection, require that only your equipment connects to that, uses that connection, because the minute you let the kids on and they go out to, uh, uh, you know, the, the kid uh, websites, one of them, forget the name, but they've, they've got, uh, oh, I think it was 12 million uh, accounts that were hacked just the other day. Oh and so, of course, the parents are paying for the subscription. So they've got the credit cards of the parents and the home address and all the billing, but they got all the other stuff for the kids. So now they've got all kinds of ways they can go to steal more information, steal more data, and of course, more, more money in the case of the credit cards and financial stuff. So um, you open yourself up to that with working from home. But the thing that, that uh, resonated with me as you were talking is the, the, the uh, relationships and the conversations that have to occur. You should be having regular conversations in the office prior to pandemic people talk. And so you may have an issue that you, you run into somebody in the hall and they say, hey, have you had this problem? And oh yeah, I have, what'd you do about it? You can do that in the office, but everybody at home, you don't have that. So you've got to have regular meetings. You've got to, and Zoom is perfect for that. We're recording this on Zoom. Uh, Microsoft has Teams and there's a, there's lately, there's just a plethora of these different products out there for people to use use them. You've got the technology, you've got the ability, you can have better, uh, more concise meetings and have them more regularly than you ever did in the office because everybody was always running every which way. Now you just have them put it on your calendar, on their calendar. You're going to meet at 10 o'clock on Thursdays and, uh, and you're good and it's done. If you don't communicate then you really don't have a company. You have a collection of individuals. And, and that's what you wind up with, with everybody basically doing what's right in their own eyes. Uh, and so- um, yeah, Great example. I, I, loved your, uh, I loved your example too with Simon Sinek. I love that book on, uh, on why it begins with why or mm -hmm. start with why. I forget the, the exact title, but it's an excellent book. So thank you. Indeed. Oh, you're welcome. So um, let me ask you, in your experience, how can teams function better? I'm remembering uh, of a book years ago, uh, maybe called The Dysfunctional Team. It was something about, of course, Is looking it, at the uh, negative. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. That's it. That it? That's it. <laughs> it's a great book. It's a great book. I would recommend it. And I would uh, suggest that people look carefully at the, at the principles that he's teaching. It is certainly one that I endorse and uh, would, would welcome. Um, I, I will summarize, in my view, what the three overarching principles of high-performing teams are. And the first would be a really positive culture. The second is high productivity. And then the third is confident leadership. All three of those need to be functioning at a high level in order for the team to be functioning at a high level. Otherwise, the team will start to erode. It'll start to atrophy down, just like our muscles. And it is, it is so important. And it, it would take a long time to go through each one of those in, in great depth. But I'm just going to, if it's OK, I'll just go very quickly on each one of those and explain a little bit more about what it means to be highly productive and and uh, have positive culture and confident leadership and how they all intertwine. Um, you can have a team that, uh, that gets along really well, and that's good, but they sometimes, and you kind of mentioned this earlier, sometimes, you know, they, they maybe go to the bathroom and they're kind of gone for a little while. And so everybody gets along, um, but they, uh, they may not be quite as productive as they, as they could and should be. And then you have the kind of flip side of it where you may have a team that is really productive. They hit all their goals and targets and a sales team may be knocking it out of the park, but they don't always get along with each other. And so there, and there are some reasons why that, that culture piece is so important. And then of course the leaders, the one that's, that's kind of driving everything and, and ensuring that things are happening at that high level. And in my view is responsible to really create that what I call picture of success and when you think about a, a, you know, a, a painting or something like that, there's a lot of detail to it. It's not just a sketch. And so when we talk about that picture of success, it's getting to the details a little bit more about understanding 
what is our picture of success? What does it really look like? What does a high performing team really look like? And that's some of what I do in the workshops is to try and help teams really dig deep on what it is that you define as good culture or high pro productivity and how can you improve them and get even better together. And I'm gonna throw another, just a, a simple principle, just very, very quickly. And, and this is something I may mention two or three times today, depending on how our conversation goes, but empathy is something that is, is uh, really critical. And especially in our current pandemic. And uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a word that, um, as, and, and Ron, you and I met because I invited you to be a guest on my podcast. And that's when I ask a particular question about uh, what other uh, advice would you give to leaders and teams? A lot of the leaders that I interview talk about empathy. They talk about the importance of really understanding your employees, being patient with them and making sure that you have their back. I mean, there's a lot of different phrases, but it really, in my view, all, all comes down to empathy. But that, that is a critical role of that, of that leader and that leader really having the confidence necessary to know what to do. And that can be a challenge for a lot of leaders, especially first time leaders, mm -hmm. when they're not quite sure what to do. They know the tasks that need to get done, mm -hmm. but as far as really helping a team become a high performing team, they don't always know what to do. And that's, yeah. that's a challenge. And that's where people like you and me can come in and help a little bit. No, I appreciate that very much. You know, I, there's, it, it strikes me as, as we discuss this, um, first time I ever saw the phrase was a, uh, a, a book, I've forgotten the author on Abraham Lincoln, Team of Rivals. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been used a lot since then, uh, often in politics, but often in business as well. And the, and the theory behind this is I went, I want to, from the CEO's standpoint, I want everybody competing against everyone else because then I know everybody's given their best. If, if you hate Joe over there and you're bound and determined to make him look like mud, well, then I know that you're going to give everything you have to it. I've never liked that, that philosophy, and I've always felt it was a losing philosophy, although I guess some people have made it work for him. Now, I don't think Abraham Lincoln used it that way. I think he wanted everyone's differing opinions, and he wanted to draw from that and, and be able to weigh things. But in business, often I've seen it used the other way, to, to, to use people against each other. What you're talking about with empathy, I think is the right way to do it. I think that you, I mean, we're all just human beings. There's one thing we have in common, and I'm, I'm old enough to remember when folks used to say this pretty regular, that there's only one race and that's the human race. Mm. We're, we're all flesh and blood and we all have emotions and feelings and, and what have you. And so when, when you work in, a, in a, an environment it's often been said that people are at work more than they're anywhere else. Right. Now, working from home puts a dent in that, but you're still, you know, you're still working. Um, you want to be happy and you want others to be happy if, if you're a functioning human being. Now, if you're dysfunctional, you may not have that. But, but I would hope that the majority of people would be there, although if I mean, if you were to watch television, it'd be hard to walk away and say that, that right. we are a functioning society at all. Right. Uh, but, right. but at the same time, you know, we, we need to have that. We need to have empathy. We need to value one another. Um, Peter Drucker, who is the, I've heard him called the godfather of business, and I've heard him call everything else. He was, a, he was an authority. I remember reading his book on management, which was that thick had the print that I, even as a young man, almost needed a magnifying glass to, to read. Um, he's quoted as saying that, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, and I think what he, he means by that, if, if indeed he said, you know, all these people get quoted and you don't know whether they really said it or not. I can't find that where he said that. But, um, but whether he did or not, it's true. When you're at one place every day, most of the work day, the most productive part of the day, well, that culture is going to dictate how you act and how you feel more so than just about anything else. Now, you, you may need to go home, you may have a family, and you may want to go home and, and just be a different person there, but you probably won't be. If you're miserable at work, 
you're probably going to carry that misery. Bring it home. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you would touch on that, I know I bounced around a little bit in that, but, but if you would uh, come back with that or, or, or feed back with that for folks. On, on culture? On culture, yes, sir. Yeah, culture, uh, it's, it's become a bit of a buzzword and it's a good one. I mean, I'm glad that we're, we're talking about culture. Um, I think that that is something that for me has been an evolutionary principle from my youngest days when I was coming out of college and having my very first experience with leadership. In the uh, leadership development industry, we refer to that at the old school way of doing things as command and control, mm -hmm. where the leader simply told people what to do. Quite often, that team leader was the most uh, tenured or senior individual therefore supposedly knew everything mm -hmm. and therefore the and i remember receiving this instruction myself in a, in a positive way but nonetheless the instruction was sean you've done a great job as a member of the team we want you to go, go in and lead the team now and turn everybody to be just like you clone them <laughs> and that's kind of a, an idea of command and control is just uh -huh. to make everybody just like you and then, and then we'll have this fantastic team because you're so fantastic i don't, I don't mean that to sound egotistical but that's kind of the way we approach leadership sometimes. We promote people based on the fact that they were successful in the position, yeah. and then we just tell them what to do. But when we talk about culture, it is a lot more than just, are we getting along? Yeah. And I used the phrase a minute ago, positive culture. And what does positive culture really look like? We talked about a picture of success and kind of getting into the details. But here's where it gets interesting is I've worked with teams. I have often asked privately, I'll sometimes, uh, depending on the circumstances, I'll interview each of the team members and I'll just ask them, how do you define culture? How do you, what, is it, what does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. You could ask 10 people to define culture and you will get 10 different answers. And that right there is a symptom of a problem because nobody knows really what it looks like. And so right. culture is, it's a great buzzword, as I mentioned ago, a minute ago, but having the ability to really dive deeper and say, okay, for our team, for our company, this is what culture looks like. This is the picture of success of having a successful team with really good culture. And there's a lot of different ways that that could be defined in its, in its own mind. But if you as the leader don't have a clear picture, you certainly can't communicate that with your team. Now, if it's a new team or you're a new leader, it may be appropriate to have that conversation and to start that and to say, okay, you know, we really don't have a clear picture here. Let's create one. Let's work together and let's let's figure out what we want our culture to be. But, you I, know, I, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, of what you were saying earlier, how often you need to revisit the why, because I think that helps you in this step. When, when you and your, and your team are all saying, why are we here? What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Uh, once you, you go through that on a regular basis, and, and that, I mean, that may be weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, whatever it is, uh, doing that on a regular basis, I, I think helps with that. It absolutely does, yeah. And that's why having regular, what I would like to call brainstorming meetings, but uh, it goes even beyond the, the brainstorming. That's why and we use the phrase psychological safety. Some of your guests and listeners may have, have heard this phrase before, but creating an environment where you can speak your mind, hopefully in a respectful way, uh -huh. but uh, be able to share ideas. And when we talk about a brainstorming session, it may be innovation. It may be how can we improve the process? How can we improve the customer experience? Uh, what new products or services do we feel like we can offer? Mm -hmm. In the current pandemic, and this is what's really interesting, part of that, that innovation or that collaboration should include problem solving. And this is where, especially in the current pandemic, that becomes even more critical. Pandemic aside, every company, every industry, sometimes a department within a company, they're going to hit a crisis. Something's going to happen that was unexpected and they don't know how to handle it initially and learning how to collaborate within the team and being able to really openly share ideas and problem solve, that's when it's really critical. I mean, it's great to talk about innovation. It's great to talk about how to make things better. That's always, you know, we'll always take that. How can we move the needle is kind of the phrase that we hear. Uh -huh. But in my mind, if you have not created a team culture that is positive 
and is open and allows people to share their ideas, then you're going to miss out on an opportunity and it could be detrimental when you do hit a crisis situation, whether it's a global pandemic or whether it's just, hey, our industry, you know, I've seen this happen where the, the government passes some kind of legislation and it affects an industry and they have to shift and they have to move. And you obviously, with your industry, you're always having to kind of shift and move. And there may be a new crisis. You have a client that suddenly has a hack or a breach of security, and you've got to jump in and figure that out. If a team can't function well together and they hit a crisis situation, some of the symptoms that we don't want to see are finger pointing, the blame game, complaining, instead of, okay, mm -hmm. Team, we've got a challenge here. Okay, well, I suggest we do this. Well, have we tried this? Well, what, 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 what about this? Would it work? It's a very different picture than the complainer side of it, where we're just pointing the fingers. Well, I, you know, hey, I didn't, I didn't do it. It wasn't my fault. Right. And those are some of the things that really contribute to a positive team culture. And so that's those are those are some of the things that I, I work with teams on and how to help them understand why culture is so important. And why, to use that phrase, it yeah. eats, uh, what, what is it, culture, uh, culture eats something, for, eats productivity for lunch or something like that? Strategy for breakfast is the quote I read, but, uh, you know, you can make that fit the, the occasion. I want to yeah. take a quick stop. Sure. Uh, just identify who we are and what we're doing here and why we're doing it uh, to fit in with what we're talking about. Um, you're listening to the Information Playground. I'm Ron Bush. I own Ron Bush Consulting. Uh, you can find me at ronbushconsulting.com. I like to keep things simple. Ron Bush is seven letters and consulting is whatever it is. So look me up that way. Uh, we're a, a cybersecurity consultancy. So um, let us know if we can give you a hand. You're listening to us in one of three ways. One is on the radio and we're broadcast through WVLP. That's an FM station. If you're local, it's 103.1. Uh, on the FM dial, if you're, uh, if you're not, you're streaming us from WVLP.org. You can find us there on Mondays from 8 to 9 a.m. and from Fridays from 1 to 2 p.m. It's a great radio station, and I hope you check out their website, and I hope you get involved. If you're interested in underwriting this program or any of their programs, uh, check, with, uh, check with the radio, info at WVLP.org. Uh, Greg is uh, the station manager, and he's a great guy. Uh, give him a call, send him an email, uh, get involved. At the same time, you may be catching us on podcast, and we're on Spotify and Apple Podcast and Google Podcast and a, a plethora of, I don't know if there's a plethora, but a, quite a few of them. And uh, you can also catch the video side on YouTube. So by all means, check us out. The information playground and if you like us i hope you subscribe to us in one of those platforms now my guest today is sean richardson and sean owns blue sky business consulting sean is there a way folks can uh, can reach you is it through your website or what's the best way to get a hold of you yeah you bet thank you the company website is blue sky biz b-i-z consulting.com and Blue and Sky are both spelled in the traditional ways. So blueskybizconsulting.com. And I have a, a pretty decent presence on LinkedIn. I'm not as active on some of the other social media platforms, which is something to, to correct someday. But uh, for right now, I'm happy on LinkedIn. But you can find me again, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, and Richards, R-I-C-H-A-R-D-S, Sean Richards on LinkedIn, as well as Blue Sky Business Consulting. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I, I want to pick up where we left off. It sounded like you were kind of leading us to start talking about connecting team members to the company's vision. Before we go there, is there anything else on culture that, uh, I mean, we could talk for a few days on culture and not yeah. exhaust the subject. But is there anything else you want to hit before we move on? You know, I think I'll just very quickly uh, toss out a, a little bit of a, a maybe an invitation or a challenge perhaps to, to leaders. Don't underestimate the, uh, the power of culture. It is something that a lot of places, they, they kind of, you know, they, they recognize it, but they don't give it a lot of attention. I would encourage you to really dig deep on what culture means to you. How do you guys communicate as a team? Are people really feeling 
open to share ideas. And a, a, I'll give you a quick example question. It's kind of a probing question. If you have a meeting, do you have individuals that never offer any kind of a comment? Mm -hmm. What are you doing to reach out to those individuals and help them feel welcome? Is there a reason why they don't? The instinctive response is, well, they're just shy. And that may be true, but that doesn't mean they don't have something to share. That doesn't mean they don't have good ideas. So it may be that they're not comfortable sharing in a group setting. So what can you do as a leader to reach out to that person on an individual basis? Maybe later you can say something like, okay, well, uh, Melissa, I appreciate that, that that's, that's a little bit more uncomfortable for you. But would you please send me an email after the meeting? If you have ideas, I'd really appreciate hearing them. And that helps that, that invitation. But what as leaders can you do? And that, that's a simple example, but are there other things that leaders can do to really improve culture? I have found that that's one of the biggest problems within teams. It isn't the productivity. They're getting things done. They're hitting deadlines, but they're not getting along. The mm -hmm. culture, and, they, and sometimes the leader has no idea because it's not obvious. They're not fighting, mm -hmm. but... They're, they're, they're holding back. And that's a lost opportunity to make improvements within the team, possibly great ideas that could help the company and help the customer, the client, because I can guarantee you if the team isn't getting along and if you've got, you've, you've got a disengaged employee, especially if they have initial contact with, with customers, that's going to that's gonna rub off. And so that's why for me, culture is such a, a big, important topic to address with teams. I had an, an, uh, an instance, I don't want to give away too much information here because I don't want anybody to be able to identify the client, but this is a, is a group of folks that uh, everyone on the, t on the team, and uh, you know, when I go into an organization, a lot of times I will be crafting a, an incident response plan in the hierarchy of, of what I do. You've got business continuity. You've got disaster preparedness and recovery. Uh, you've got um, uh, information security policies and procedures, and then you've got incident response plans. So uh, that's uh, that's primary. You can you can work your way up from bottom to top or from top down. You need all of those, uh, especially in this day and age. And and if nothing has has proven that this pandemic has, how many businesses are out of business. Uh, I, I hate to think about next year, what bankruptcy court is gonna look like, because it, it may be awful. Right. But it, my where I was going with this is, it seemed like everybody on the team, uh, and these are, these are folks within the company that all have something to add. In this case, it was an incident response plan. What do you do when there is, is an incident? Who do you notify? Who takes care of this responsibility? It's much like a, a business continuity plan or a disaster recovery and preparedness plan, but it's more focused. And so in this case, I, I had a number of folks that would not, I mean, it, asking a question was, you know, if I had that cricket sound that year, uh, you know, on television and the commercials, when somebody asked something, I would have played it all day long because uh, nobody wanted to open their mouth and risk being embarrassed, saying something they thought was dumb and all that stuff. And so what I did, now I'm just there, I'm, a, I'm there as a consultant, so I'm not there for a long period of time. You know, I had to reach out to each one privately and ask, you know, why is it that, that no one does? Why is it that you don't? And, you know, there was just a, uh, we, we talked about the team of rival taken to the extreme earlier, uh, I mean, that's pretty much what it was. Everybody was scared to death of being embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And so I had to be careful. I did exactly what you just suggested. I would ask them to, if they, if they thought of anything or if they, they could uh, give, give me some ideas, give me some feedback, what have you, email me. And then some wanted to be recognized in the next meetings. Others didn't. Don't mention my name. I don't want my name attached to that. So it's important to do exactly what you said. It's also important to ask them what kind of recognition they want. They may want it private, they may not want any, and they may want it public. So you've just got to be careful in, in I guess, in every case, because everybody's different. It's a great comment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that is a, a really core principle of leadership is to understand that you're dealing with individuals yeah. and you want to harness the team 
But I, I love that example that you shared, Ron, because that is so true and so accurate that we run into all the time with any kind of a, an assembly of people, any kind of a team that you can, you know, whether it's a sports team, whether it's an orchestra, mm -hmm. whether it is a, uh, something in a, in a work environment. But I love that example. And you're absolutely right. Great. Well, thank you. So, so let's move on. How do you get team members aligned to the company vision? I mean, we've talked about how you express it and how you discuss it. How do you get everybody to play on the same team, pull the same way? Yeah, it is, it is a challenge. It is a challenge because again, as we've talked about, you're dealing with individuals. And I'll, I'll give two suggestions. It's, it's a very deep topic, but I'll suggest two things for the, the viewers and listeners to consider and to uh, hopefully impl implement. And the two things are values and communication. And so just to go a little bit more into that, you know, values, values dictate decisions. We make decisions every day, all throughout the day. A lot of times we don't even realize that we're making decisions based on what we value. Right. And I'll give a, I, I share a kind of a, almost a humorous example, but um, I value following the law. Okay. I, I believe that you should follow the law. And that sounds like, well, of course you do. Yeah. Well, the second thing that I value, or there's, there's many, but another thing that I value is being on time. If I need to be somewhere, I want to leave in such a, a manner that I'm there on time. Well, I have a feeling I know where you're going. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you do because we all run into this and you find yourself running late. Yes. And so then I'm faced with a decision. It's like, okay, I've got both of these values. Which one wins? Which one am I, am I going to speed excessively and therefore run the risk of getting caught or in a worst case scenario, you know, causing an accident or having a real serious problem? Or do I give up on the being punctual part? Yeah. And so there, though that's a simple example, a very simple example of how our value system gets created over time. And it's different. Mm -hmm. One person, you know, Ron, you may be the type that says, yeah, I'm going to put the metal to the pedal, pedal to the metal and just go. Uh -huh. And I may be the one that says, you know what, I, I, I'll just have to apologize to the client that I'm going to be late meeting. And even that, it, it sometimes it depends on the situation, which, uh, you know, in, a, in an extreme example, if you are in a, in a health crisis and you're trying to get to a hospital or something, you're probably gonna, you're probably going to speed a little bit and, and hope that, uh, that the officer will understand. <laughs> But, uh, but I use that example as a way of, of introducing this, this idea of values, because everybody comes to work with a different set of values. And it is so important that you do two things. Number one, that you understand their value system as best you can. And you don't necessarily have to agree with it. You just need to understand it. But it's, it's imperative that you understand them because the other part you have to know is what the company values are. Right. Well, I'll, I'll use a simple example that a lot of people are familiar with. You've heard this phrase. We've all heard this phrase in any, almost any situation, both as a, as a professional or as a, in, a, in a business setting, as well as a consumer, this idea that the customer is always right. Well, if as a company, you decide that that's going to be a strong value, that yes, we're going to approach it that the customer is always right, that's going to dictate decisions that you're going to make. But here's the problem. Is that absolutely true? What if the, the customer wants you to do something that's illegal? Right? Mm -hmm. I don't think too many of us are going to then comply with this idea that the customer is always right. right. But let's bring something a little bit closer to home and a little bit more realistic. What if they ask for a refund for services that you've provided? If the customer is always right, then that would imply that you have to refund the money because if they were unhappy, then you need to refund them. Right. But it's amazing what will happen within an organization on that exact point. And I share that because I had an experience like this years ago when I was working. It was a little uh, job when I was in, uh, in college, and it was a customer service representative. And I had a, a customer, and I had been told and trained that under certain conditions, if they have not been met, we do not issue a refund. So I had a customer get on the phone with me, and they were upset, and I stood my ground as per the training. And they finally said those famous words, that famous sentence, I want to talk to your boss. I want to talk mm -hmm. to your manager. So like, no problem. And almost immediately, my manager said, no problem, we'll issue a refund. And I had just spent five minutes defending what I thought was the right answer. Yeah. Now, 
that was frustrating for me. And in that moment, I became what we would define as a disengaged employee. I was very frustrated. I was like, wait a minute. I was trained and this is exactly what happened. And so I, I kind of, after we got off the call, of course, I, I kind of, in a respectful way, but kind of got into it a little bit with the boss. I was like, what did I do wrong? Why did you reverse? You didn't back me up. And it, now it makes me look like I'm the jerk mm-hmm. when I'm following the procedures here. It's like, well, you know, sometimes we can make exceptions. And it was like, okay, well, when are those exceptions acceptable? Help me to understand that so that I know where the leeway is at. And again, this is back, you know, many, many years ago. And so that was kind of back in what we refer to, and I mentioned it earlier, that command and control. Mm-hmm. The response that the manager gave me is, well, that's that's a manager decision. And I just decide that. Mm-hmm. Well, that created for me a disconnect with the company and with that manager, because now I felt, you know, you can imagine what would happen the next time I had an angry customer. Like, well, now what do I do? Am I, am I just going to get tossed under the bus again? Mm-hmm. And so values are really important to understand what is important and especially to be able to communicate that. And that's the second thing, values and then the communication. And this is where it gets challenging because again, just like with culture, we may think that we have a pretty good idea of what it means, but if you don't dig deep and ask everybody, hey, what does it mean to provide excellent customer service? That's one that we see a lot. We are going to provide excellent customer service. Well, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. And is it possible that the value of the company is not clearly understood even within the company? And therefore, the employee is thinking, well, I'm providing excellent customer service to, to our, our customers. But the company is saying, well, not quite, because this is how we see it. This is where you can do better. This is where you can do even more. That's where the communication comes in. In my view, it is horribly insufficient to simply put a list of values or a mission statement, slap it on the wall and call it good. You cannot do that. In my view, when we have those meetings that you and I were talking about a little bit earlier about whether it's a brainstorming meeting, whether it's just a regular staff meeting, whatever it is, there are opportunities to reflect and think about, hey, what's happened recently that might challenge one of these values? Are there some things that we've experienced that we have a question about? And give those employees an opportunity to provide some input on hey, I'm running into this. What do I do? And that is where, again, going back to the effective leadership question, that is why it's so important to have a really confident leader that knows how to do that, that knows how to ask really good questions, that knows how to communicate effectively those values and how they look. And that will help tie in every little thing that they're doing that will help them tie into their their tasks the objective of the company to that vision and really help the employees feel like, yes, I'm connected and I understand what we're trying to accomplish and I understand the vision and I agree with it and I'm ready to move forward. So those are some some quick ideas, just values and communication that can help the employees connect with the vision of the company. Oh, I love the points and I love the examples. You remind me of a book I read earlier in the year. I think it's called Questions Are the Answer. Mm. It's a It's a business book and it's you can apply that that title in a lot of different scenarios. If you're in sales, uh, you know, qu- leading with questions to get to the to the place that you want to be making the sale. But it's also in any kind of leadership environment. How do you get people to to tell you their thoughts? How do you get better ideas? If you're always the smartest guy in the room, you're in trouble because the, <laughs> you don't know everything. Right. And so um, you've got to be able to ask the right questions, ask them in the right way, and to make people feel comfortable to, to answer you, to get the best out of them, their best ideas. Uh, excellent, excellent point. Yeah. I, you see me making notes, so I've got all this stuff going on. Uh, uh, um, I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit more. We've talked a lot about leadership qualities. Mm-hmm. How do you... Um, I guess, first off, what are some, some qualities that leaders can develop within themselves and how do they develop them? How do you, how do you go about this? But, but let's identify what those qualities are first. We've talked about empathy and, and that leads into a little bit of what you were just talking about, Ron, about asking good questions. That is something that has become a bit of a a passion within a passion, if you will. I'm passionate about leadership development. I've kind of created almost a a sub 
passion mm -hmm. of learning how to ask good questions. A, a, just a, a funny little situation. I've got twin daughters. They're teenagers. And they're in high school. So they're in that dating mode where they're, they're, you know, and my girls are a little bit, they're kind of on the shy side. And so part of what my wife and I will do is we're having family dinner is we'll, we'll just have some fun with them and say, okay, let's pretend that we're on a date. What are some questions that you can ask? And it applies in so many settings. Mm -hmm. It can apply if you're just meeting people for the first time. If you're networking, if you're in a situation where you're networking, learning to ask really good questions is so helpful. And as a leader, when we talk about empathy, when we talk about individuals on the team, when we talk about how to define culture, when we define you know, values and vision connection and all of these different things, learning to ask really good questions. And as you pointed out, how to ask them. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful when you email the question because it may not be interpreted in quite the same way as if you ask it in person. Right. And so when to ask the questions and, and sometimes you have to time it just right because if you... If you ask an innocent question at the wrong time, it can be misinterpreted. Even mm -hmm. if you were completely innocent and in, in your intention behind the question, you have to let the timing be there. So leaders, in my view, one of the most important things a leader can learn to do, one of the greatest skills uh, or qualities that they can develop is learn how to ask really good questions. And it's something that I've become, again, very passionate about, very fascinated with it. I find myself wanting to ask questions in a standard, almost boring way. And I pause for a second. I think, okay, Sean, is there a different way to ask the question that you want to ask that will bring out more from this person? Not just, so where did you grow up? But uh, you might ask, you might have to ask just to get the information. Just say, so did you grow up around here or where are you from? Tell me about your experience growing up in that area and allow the person to open up, open up a little bit. It's a simple example, but as a leader, if you can learn how to ask really, really good questions and kind of be in the moment and learn to, to be flexible and say, you know what, I need to not ask this question or I need to ask a different question, that will help in, in a, innumerable ways to get information out of people, to help them feel comfortable and to trust you and learning to ask really good questions. I can never emphasize it enough. The other thing that I would suggest that, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch, but I, I think, uh, you know, other, other than empathy and learning to ask good questions, another quality that I would encourage leaders to look within themselves to help, uh, you know, improve the team, but it starts with themselves, is to know what your strengths are. I am a big fan of understanding your own strengths, developing them, learning how you use them when you're most effective and learning how to use them more often. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, I would encourage any leader to do the same with their team members, but we're, we're going to talk just for a second about the leader. And, and sometimes uh, consultants su such as myself will refer to that as leadership style, knowing what your style is as a leader, where are you strongest? You might be the type of leader that is a cheerleader. You're the motivator. You're the one that can get up there and rah, 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 let's do it and, and really know how to motivate people in a group setting. Or you may be the type of leader that does better if you get to know each individual on the team really, really well and can be that flexible, that flexible leader, if you will. You might be the one that's a little bit more task driven that, hey, let's, let's, we need to get these things done. And there's a place for each of those. And sometimes you even need to move from one style to the other. But if you know your strengths and what you're naturally good at and have really developed them well, that is a, a, a benefit to you and to the team. And so, I, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a certified strengths coach with Gallup. And so part of the reason why I, I went that direction is because I felt so passionately about learning your strengths and how to develop them. It's a very positive message. It's a very, this is what I'm good at. And I don't have to worry about where I'm not as strong. We need to manage the weaknesses, but you don't have to be everything to everybody. You can find out what you're good at and really excel in that. And so those are the, you know, the, the, the two things that I would, or three things perhaps is to, to develop empathy and to learn how to ask really good questions and to know and develop your own strengths. Those are the three things I'd recommend that, quali that the leaders can to develop within themselves. Excellent, excellent. I, there's, a, there's a book, there's actually three of them that I've read. Um, the first one was Know Your Strengths, I think. 
um, and I've forgotten the other two. It's been, they've been out a, a number of years. I thought they were excellent books at the time. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. We're, we're down to the, to the last few minutes, Sean. So let me, let me ask you for some final words before we run out of time. It's been a tumultuous year as we reflect on 2020 and then as we look ahead to the new year, what else can leaders do to empower their teams? Well, we said it a couple of times. I, I think that um, you know empathy is probably the one that's coming to mind the most. And tied in with that is just good old fashioned patience. We, uh, and, I, and I wanna be careful, I don't wanna step into too many uh, traps here, but um, we, we have become a country that's become a little bit impatient with each other. And we need to be patient as people learn. We need to be patient as people struggle, make mistakes. And the ability to allow people to make those mistakes, to, to use the harsher word, fail, but work with them to overcome it. Don't leave them there, mm -hmm. but let's work together to find ways to be more productive and to be more open, have a better culture. But I really do think that patience and empathy is something that in this current situation that we're in, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's a political climate or racial division, whatever it may be, a little bit more patience and empathy and really uh, listening to each other and uh, developing that, that caring interest in each of your team members, I believe is just it, so critical in today's culture and in today's, today's environment, what we're dealing with. Gosh, I love that. I love that, Sean. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a guy that paces in front of the microwave. You know, it, we, we've all gotten used to that. Um, but I, I couldn't agree more with what you said. You know, people don't learn instantaneously. Most of us, it takes a lifetime to learn the, the lessons, the life lessons that we do learn. I'm reading a book right now that talks about latest studies on education. And they're finding that students that fail at the beginning and struggle to learn stuff, learn deeper and better and retain and, and can recall for much longer periods of times than those that just, okay, here's the, here's the information in the classroom. Now I'll take a test because now you forget it. That's why uh, the teachers always recommend you don't, uh, you don't crash before the, the course. You, uh, you, you take your time to study it, to, to assimilate it, incorporate it as part of you. Well, that's true in the rest of life as well. The leaving the classroom environment, um, there's just, I mean, we have, uh, 70 or so years to, to learn, learn a few things. Uh, some of us learn better than others and, and retain better, but uh, man, I couldn't agree with that more. I, I love the way you said it. We've just got a couple of minutes, enough time for me to, to wrap up the show. I, I would love to have more time. Maybe we can do this again sometime in the future. You got You've been listening to the Information Playground I'm Ron Bush. I own Ron Bush Consulting, and uh, uh, we help companies uh, protect themselves, their clients, limit their liability in the case of a data breach. But, uh, but the whole thing starts with understanding the issues and, and how to uh, protect. There's, nothing is, is hack proof. No company or organization is hack proof, but you can do a lot of things to protect your company's reputation and yourself, your employees, your clients. Uh, the information playground is underwritten by Ron Bush Consulting, but we are available on a number of different platforms and formats, podcasting, YouTube, and of course, WVLP. I hope that, uh, that you'll, you'll join us again. I want to thank Sean Richards for being our guest today. He's the uh, founder and, and CEO of Blue Sky Biz Con Consulting been a great guest and I've, I've certainly enjoyed everything that, uh, that we've discussed. Tell us once again, Sean, how can people reach you? What's a good way to contact you? Well, thank you, Ron. It is, I always enjoy talking about this, but you've been a great host because you were engaging and asked some good questions. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you. you. The best place to find us is uh, at www.blueskybizconsulting.com. That's blueskybizconsulting.com. And you are welcome to check out our podcast, which is the Team Engagement Podcast on all the major platforms. And I'm on LinkedIn. So you can find either Sean Richards or Blue Sky Biz Consulting or Business Consulting on LinkedIn. 
and we'd be happy to communicate with you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.